Whoa. Let me just say, uh, I, I wanted to speak a little bit about risk, what risk is all about. Many years ago, there are a lot of people who shed blood, you know, to give us what we needed out of what we fought for out of the labor movement. They took their risks, and in many cases, they lost their lives. The thing that we have to do today, if we're thinking about the future, is to take risk. And in many cases, if you don't risk anything, you don't get anything. And I'll tell you, right now, the powers that be are getting even more powerful. And the risk is going to be great. So I know within uh, the telephone company, I was, at the time, they were the largest corporation in the world in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I was fired a record seven times coming out of there. <laughs> but it was, it, was, it was all a risk, and I, don't, I can't count how many times I was arrested. And I also ran the longest strike in CWA history. So these are the things that when you talk about risk and you decide to clog up the Midtown Tunnel and you decide that you're going to go to the, right, to the president of the telephone company's house in his neighborhood to knock on his door, it's the last person you, he ever wanted to see. Uh, these are somewhat risk, and these are risk takers. Many of the young folks that are out there doing their pieces and all, I think we can look at, I can look at this audience, and I know many of you have stood on that line as well. So I'm saying what we have to teach those who come, who we organize, that there is a risk in what we do, but it's worth it. So at this stage, Donna DeWitt, once again, no, needs no introduction. Uh, Donna definitely has been a, a fighter from the, from the very beginning, going back to independent labor and so forth. And we've got to talk, uh, at some point, we may have to start talking about that again. Uh, or we have to talk about an independent labor movement, and we have to talk about a labor agenda when it comes to our politicians, because the Democrats are deserting us as well. So I give you Donna DeWitt. My fellow CWA radical. So, um, what, what I, I really want to do, and, and I want to go ahead and start the stopwatch here, Dennis, and help you, is tonight I, what I'd like to do, we, it's been a wonderful weekend. And I want to you know, say to the planning committee, thank you for, once again, everything you've done. And I want to address you, the delegates, who have been so diligent and patient. And I know from years with my convention and, and folks that will sit even longer than the planned agenda to be able to talk about labor and to talk about the struggles and to talk about what we need to do. And you are those folks. And I want to thank you, and I want to talk with you, um, because we have talked about all of the issues, I think, that we need to be addressing. So I want to talk about your role, our role as leaders. And first of all, I want to acknowledge that when I decided to retire um, last year, that it was, it was a difficult decision. You know, I took five years to do it. <laughs> My husband had a stroke uh, six years ago, this August, and he and I made that decision because we didn't know if he would live, and of course he's a very strong man, and so I knew the best way to handle him was for me not to be with him all the time, <laughs> because <laughs> he would have never lived if I had to take care of him all the time. So we talked about it, and he said, and, and he's a businessman, and he's been a businessman all of his life, he and his brothers worked really hard. And this was hard on him because he was still working at 74. He didn't draw Social Security at 72. He was a workaholic. So when I sat down with him and we decided that um, I would retire in five years. And he was bedridden at the time. So I hired someone that I knew would be good with him. She was friends of, their fa of, our, of his family growing up. 
she'd taken care of her father who had a stroke. So he said to me, I know you love your work, so I don't want you to retire now. So I planned. And in doing that, um, I really want I had two vice presidents that were just my left and right hand, Ken Riley and Aaron McKee. And I'm telling you, you couldn't have better vice presidents than these two folks. And Aaron, being a single mom, would have loved to have taken it. And of course, I didn't retire um, during a convention. So our bylaws, our constitution and bylaws required that one of the vice presidents and then we would go to the board. And I was really stunned. Erin decided that she couldn't do that with a full-time job with a son in college. So when I thought, when I, when I went to Ken with it, and we all know that Ken is a fighter and he's out there internationally, nationally. I discussed it with him before and uh, he, you know, he wasn't interested and I was really surprised when he said, Donna, I'll do this for you. And, and Ken stepped in and decided, because I had made that commitment to my husband, and so the first thing I want to really say is that Ken um, helped me with that decision and has made you know, life much better for me to have to deal with my husband now after the five years of his illness. But he's been a great leader. He was my right hand, Aaron was my left hand, and, to, and now um, he's been able to enable me to do the things that I really want to do with the flexibility in my life. And that goes back to saying that we make sacrifices. So when you're here, I know it's a sacrifice. Dennis has, what, 28 grandchildren, Dennis? Oh, God. 28? Uh, 26. 26, but you have eight great grands? Or? Eight great grands. And you know what? They're giving him a hard time about being here because grandkids rule. If you don't have any, I'll tell you, grandkids rule. They rule. And so you made a sacrifice to be here, and I know that. With your families, we've made sacrifices, and for the young people, they make sacrifices too, because I know that some of the young people that want to come to our convention sometimes, and this is the truth, you know, they're having such a difficult time, and, and I had one say to me, I want to be there, but I really don't have the gas money. I said, well, I'll repay you. He said, I, I don't have the gas to get down there. I said, well, I've never used Western Union, but I'll wire you some money. And I did. And that's how he was able to come to our convention. He wouldn't have been able to come if I hadn't wired him the money to buy the gas. So young people are having a difficult time. And so in our role as leaders, I want to use um, some, what, some of you were in Charleston when I received a great honor in January, and that was the Harvey Gantt Triumph Award. But the great thing about it was, I was more honored because I was receiving it along with Congressman John Lewis. Whew, you know, so Ken Riley presented me the award, and Congressman Clyburn presented John Lewis. And I'm sort of, I'm going to use some of his comments because I think it it tells us about the mentality that sometimes we take as leaders. Um, he spoke to us. Congressman Lewis was a very humble man, in my opinion talked about when he was a child, how he really wanted to help people and talk to them. And he talked about, he told the story about how he, they raised chickens in the country. And I think it was in Alabama, I think it was, Ken, he grew up. Alabama. Yeah. So he said his siblings, he was a little boy and his siblings wouldn't listen to him. Now think about this, he's sitting around trying to talk to his siblings and they're challenging him. And all of this was going through my mind as a labor leader. He said, so he decided to start sneaking the eggs of the chickens. And he got him enough that he hatched this, this, little, you know, this little brood of chickens here. And he talked to the chickens. And they would nod their heads, he said. And he said they didn't talk back to him. And, you know, I took from that. And here's a man who years later knew his destiny. And he answered the call to serve people. He was beaten in Rock Hill, South Carolina. When he got off the bus, he was beaten severely, hospitalized. But do you know, a few years ago, he told us the man that had beaten him came to his congressional office in Washington and cried and asked his forgiveness. So folks, sometimes it's not a short time. It could be the perfect storm, but many times it's just having to wait and having to continue to work as Congressman Lewis did. 
And of course, he found, just like those siblings, that those constituents, and we do as our members, as leaders, they're not going to all agree with us. You know, we're leaders, and we have been empowered many times to make decisions. And like that destiny, we have to sometimes, um, as a leader, listen and be challenged. Now, t today, we've been challenged. We have a lot of challenges in front of us. Um, like Congressman Lewis, you know, we can, we can forgive and start working to, to bring those things together, to move them forward. And also that day, Ken, when he gave me my award, used Ecclesiastes, and he really just really blew me away because Ecclesiastes, he spoke about the, uh, a time to love and a time to hate. And the folks knew, who, knew me, they knew how much I could love that you couldn't have a better friend in a time of need. And then he said, but there's another side of Donna that you may not know, that she can hate. And I was on the podium up here with like a thousand people out there, and I was just said, oh no, what is he going to say? Uh, and he said, she hates an injustice. She hates an injustice, and when there is one, she is going to fight for it, you know, to make sure that that injustice is addressed. And as leaders, it's about who we serve. It's about our members. It's about the obligation we have to society. It's about being risk takers. And when you look at great leaders, we have to remember. I mean, Ken and I share our faith, and um, we both are Christians. And whether you answer to a higher power, um, when you look at King David, as we would, and you see that he, was, he loved God and he was a great leader. But when Nathan came to him and put his bony finger in his face and said, you, you are the man that took you know, from the poor man. A lot of times as leaders, folks, we don't see ourselves, as Brett said, right or left sometimes. We think we're right. So as a leader, I think we have an obligation always to remember these things. One. There's always going to be the chicks, their followers, and they, they, they're going to nod their head, and we can lead them. They're going to be those that are our siblings, our members, that will always challenge us. And then we're going to be good leaders. You're good leaders. You're here because you care. And yes, there are some of those charities that have been doing this for many decades. But you young folks, and you folks that have been doing it for decades, you do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Remember what it was like to be their age. I do. I do. And I still sometimes get thrown out with the bathwater after all these decades. So we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And my challenge to you tonight is to, to be the risk taker, but be the good leader. You, you've dedicated your life in many cases, and you're dedicating your life now as a young leader. Make sure that when your members look to you and the community looks to you, that you are exemplifying the, the fact that, that you are breaking down the barriers of injustice. You are defending human rights. You are a risk taker. You're willing to make the sacrifices. You're willing to say, we are one. And we can make this happen, folks. And we can do it. We can make history right now, right now today, we can do it tomorrow, we can change the labor movement, we can change this country, and we can bring us back where we need to be. So thank you so much.